Moving on to our scientific session, our first session for the day is on the topic Engaging Adolescents in Therapy, Challenges, Dynamas and Methods. I request the chairperson of the session, Dr. Shaliba Ma'am, to take over. Thank you, Dr. Neva. Neva. The first session for the day is on Engaging Adolescents in Therapy, Challenges, Dilemmas, and Methods. The speaker is Dr. Sonia Bhaskaran. She has done her uh, Doctorate of Medicine in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry from the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, MD Psychiatry from IMH Chennai. She is currently a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist in Insight Clinic, Coimbatore and also a teaching faculty in postgraduate CAMH course, Pathways, Coimbatore. She was a former assistant professor, Department of Psychiatry, PhD Institute of Mental Sci uh, Medical Sciences and Research, Coimbatore. Former consultant, Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist, Vadikati Mental Health Center, and also in the Department of Pediatrics, GKNM Hospital, Coimbatore. Dr. Soumya has won various awards and she has a lot of honors. She has won the partial scholarship to attend the International Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect Congress at Calgary in 2016. She has won the Best Poster Award at the Biennial Indian Association of Child and Adolescent Mental Health Conference in 2015. She has won the ICMR Travel Award to att attend World Congress of Psychiatry at Spain in 2014. She has four publications in peer-reviewed Asian and Indian journals. Uh, the highlights are uh, the public. Uh, the highlights of her publication are in uh, childhood dis uh, diseases, in ICD-11, and its relationship with DSM-5 and ICD-10. That is one of her uh, highlight publications, and the other one is on challenges in working with sexually abused children. So she has written two book chapters on specific learning disorder in Indian scenario and ethics in child psychotherapy which is published by Springer. She has been a resource person in various national and international scientific meetings on mental health in school children, evaluation and management of child sexual abuse and pediatric bipolar disorder. I welcome Dr. Soumya start her uh, session. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm so thankful to uh, the organizers at Chaitanya Medical College for organizing this wonderful CME. It seems really like something I, I would love. I'm waiting, looking forward to what all is going to happen and what the kind of uh, enriching knowledge that we're possibly going to get. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll begin. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is about adolescence challenges, dilemmas, and methods. Uh, with adolescents, so each time uh, to this day when I have an adolescent coming into my OPD, I wonder, oh my God, what is going to happen today? So every session that I have is like a very challenging thing. So this is really from my heart to say what are the experiences that I've had and to see uh, what are the things that I've chosen to look at. So this is an experience. Uh, why is it so challenging to work with adolescents? When we look at it, we are communicating with people who are undergoing a rapid psychological and social change. So um, in, in the sense that um, these are people who are undergoing social changes in peer circles, they're going from school to college and we are also looking at people who are, uh, you know, moving in, in terms of problem solving, in terms of thinking, in terms of consequential thinking. So we're communicating with a personality that's going such a rapid change. And then I ask myself, are we able to look at things from their perspective, which is to look at um, 
lot of times like these days when i ask uh, young people so are you talking to your friends you know do you call them often and everybody gives me this physical look as if who even talks on the phone anymore in the sense we chat we are on instagram we are on tiktok we are sharing videos so are we are playing games together so the method of communication so we were the people who used to talk on the phone so these are people who chat so do we understand what their life is like they have endless amount of energy and there are many many on the spot crises to manage so from ranging from let's say um i need to go out for this party to something as serious as self harm and suicidal intent looking at supporting people through unsafe and difficult experiences so let's say um it's about sexting uh, let's say it's about um going out and using drugs so it's about supporting people through these unsafe experiences they do not share adults understanding of the society on one hand the endless optimism that they seem to have as opposed to the cynicism that many adults have so they are not they are change makers really and do they have the cognitive abilities to decide so these are people whose consequential thinking is still developing but do they have the kind of cognitive ability to decide between treatment alternatives in light of future risk of health so these are all the things that come to mind and and of course shorter consultation times so you know the clock is always ticking so these are things to think about and in the middle of all this of this how do we remain hopeful and impartial that is the challenge that we have what is the general approach of an adolescent therapist so these are the basics so understanding of a developmental perspective i think this is a basic thing so where are they socially i mean a 13 year old in terms of social interactions is different from an 18 year old and how important peer relationships are to them in terms of a 13 year old whose problem solving and consequential thinking is developing to a 18 year old who is much better at it to look at active engagement how do we actively engage with this person uh whether it's a reluctant person whether it's a person who is upset and is not able to talk so how do we still actively engage with them how do we make therapy active and fun how do we involve them so is to be able to involve them in goal setting really to say what are the things that you would like to work on today and most importantly seeing the adolescent behind the problem so often when we look at it we hear people who will say okay this child you know is not um, is hitting is rude is doesn't listen to us spends all the time online things like that so to say what do we how do we still see the child behind this problem all of these problem behaviors and when we look at it i think my cursor is stuck a bit yes so then how do we look at um advocating for the adolescent sometimes so what happens is so there are people who want to do like two days ago somebody came to see me who who's interested in fashion design so who wants to shift she's been doing first year sociology but now what she wants to do is um you know uh, what she wishes to do is design so her mom said to me that uh, i don't think design is a great option it's not a respectable option for young women in our village so this is some place where um people still i mean so i still had to advocate for the adolescent with the mom to say look you know yes in your village maybe fashion design is not a great thing for young people but this is really what this girl wants to do and you're a teacher and you know it's not an you know a one that brings disrespect so can you see that so advocate for the adolescent when necessary and then we look at family as a collaborator in therapy so when i look at that often i used to think that you know family is oh my god why won't they just understand the adolescent and a lot of times the anger of the adolescent is also something that i would feel and i put pass in on to families but now i see that i see i'm going to see the adolescent once a week maybe once in two weeks but the family is the person who needs to help them so it's important to take them on as collaborators in therapy and 
So when see what do adolescents have to say? So there was a study which uh, which was a qualitative study which looked at what do how do adolescents want therapy or treatment to be? So what did they say? Treat me like I'm on your level. So don't treat me like a child. You know, address me uh, at your level. Tell me a little bit about yourself. They would like to know about therapists. Ask my permission to make notes. I know all of us often will do this. So, you know, somebody saying a lot of information, we busy writing. So they say, no, ask me. So, you know, okay, you know, this is a lot of information to take. So can I just write a bit? Pay attention to what you're saying. So um, phone calls in between. I, I do that. I, I check um, my pharmacist's medication in between. So these are things that they find very, very difficult to take. Don't call me names in terms of this is an oppositional, this is a, res a resistant person, things like that. So let's not, you know, label them really. What's in the room stays in the room. I see a young people, confidentiality is so, so important to them. So this is what they have to say. Challenges. So I've enlisted three challenges. So let's go on to see what they are. So the first one, which I think all of us would have faced, I don't have a problem. Nothing is wrong with me. So this is... The first issue. So there was a 16 year old person who had come for consultation uh, because uh, he was studying in, uh, you know, in a hostel and he had left that hostel and run away to a Miss Bro and was found on a railway station. And he said, I've come here to play street, uh, street basketball matches. He had previously been evaluated by four different psychiatrists and all of them told uh, that the adolescent does not have a disorder. So this was while I was still in medical college. So uh, the senior resident was presenting to me. And to me, in my head, I thought, there are four people who have said that this person doesn't have a problem. Why would this parent still be carrying this person to from psychiatrist to psychiatrist? And I was, it was the end of the day and I was already like frustrated. And of course, um, fact, also one of the psychiatrists was my husband. So I said, oh, he said there's no problem. So, you know, will there be? He seems to be a decent psychiatrist. So with this bias was where I started. But I also thought about another thing. As we were looking at history, I said, here is a child who takes 100 rupees in his pocket overnight and ends up at a railway station. Something about it is off. So the fifth sand consultation began. So I was already aware of my bias where I was already feeling, you know, if so many people have said he doesn't have anything, maybe he doesn't. So, and there was a self-reflection though that, but I still think something is off about it. So where I started was non-critical, non-judgmentally. So fine, is running away wrong, right? No, let's leave that out. We're not looking at why did you run away? No. I thought the approach that I would take is an active in interest in the adolescent as a person. So I said to him, look, um, yeah, yes, I spoke to him and I said, look, you know, you say that, yes, you left there, but you know, you're okay now and you're here in the city doing your job and nothing seems apparently wrong with you. Sure, I agree with you. But at the end of this consultation, what happens is that you'll probably go to a sick psychiatrist. But so let's work together and see where this takes us. So let's figure out along the way whether there is something to worry about you or not. I am just interested in your version of events, your life really. So my stance was curious. And then to look at, and this young person seems to be a very independent young person. So I said, I would like to see you in two different sessions. So I saw only the adolescents. The adolescent will travel and come to the clinic without his parents. And I'd see his parents in a different session. Background that we got was this family had severe marital discord. Father was an authoritarian figure quick to anger and possibly had undiagnosed ADHD. He had had very many changes in school and no steady friends really. His interests were reading, music and basketball. As um, when we spoke about his childhood, so we went away from the problem, we looked at his life. So he remembers books being his best companions. He said, I don't usually express my feelings to anybody. Maybe my mom a little bit, not at all to my dad. And after 10th, I wanted to pursue engineering. My parents being doctors, both wanted me to pursue medicine. I hate medicine. And uh, he felt that his dad doubted his capacity to do it. 
uh, he said, maybe you're not good at math. And dad, in his own possibly thought he was supportive and he told him, I'll get you a seat. Even if you're unable to do well, I'll get you a seat. Which was something that A did not take very well. So he was like, oh, dad thinks I can't do this. Then from there, he went on to join a city famous for uh, coaching hubs, where he said there were just goons sitting so who would make them sit for long hours. So if they got up, they'd get beaten up. So then what happened was, and he told his parents and they shifted him at once. And then he says he fell into bad company. He, in the sense that he would just miss classes and parents would call him 40, 50 times. He wouldn't receive their calls. Then they said, okay, something is off. Then they changed it again. And this coaching class, he was attending it well. But then he says, one day I thought I must go to the Metro and play basketball and I left. What happens? So the usual approach is see, to look at Instead of going to what do you think you were feeling, which is a difficult thing to say, go from, which is what Dr. Girimaji says, facts to events, to problems, then emotions. So the fact is that these are the things that happened to his life. A specific event, yes, was moving. Then we move on to look at problems and then we may go to emotions. Now, um, in between, of course, I had sessions with the parents. So what the parents said to me, do you really believe everything he has to say? There's something wrong. I don't believe it. So a lot of times parents will ask you, do you believe him? Do you believe him? So I look at it. I say, I, I believe the adolescent every time. I listen to their story on face value. And sometimes we know it stretches the border of credulity. So what we may do is to draw attention to inconsistencies in the story. Like what we did was look, you know, you always seem to have a plan in your life. You are methodical. You look at things. You see what needs to be done. You have a plan of where you want to do engineering. So this thing seems so inconsistent that you impulsively get on a train and go. I find that, you know, quite inconsistent with what you've been telling me about yourself. And the idea is that then young people, I look at it like this. So when the client is empowered, they are able to re-examine contracts that don't fit and then they may be able to talk to us about a construct that really fits. So then he said, I can't tell you why I went. I said, that's okay. We looked at an explorative. So can you tell me the reasons why this is difficult to talk about? So we sidestep it and we say, look, let's look at what, why is it difficult to talk about? And always we respect the disclosure process to say, look, um, I respect that you can say things when you want to and you have total control of what and when you want to say. And then he said, I'll think about it and come back next time. Then he came back and said, okay, I'll tell you, I went to find inspiration, but I can't tell you exactly what I was going to do there for inspiration. And then we do, so then we bring the fun element. So he's like, do you want to guess? And I'm like, sure. Can I guess? Uh, and then we went on to guess many things. Um, we guessed, uh, I guessed whether uh, he'd gone to work in a hotel. Did he want to have an experience of living in difficult circumstances? But he said no to everything. But then I reflected, okay, this is a scary thing and possibly very difficult to talk about for you. But let's go back a bit and look at what made you seek this inspiration. Then we do so we explore about it together to see what makes a person seek inspiration really. And let's look at if it fits. Then we uncovered emotions to look at, yes, small things started seeming big just before in the last coaching class. He was highly self-critical. He felt very guilty when he wasn't able to get good marks. He always wanted perfection. He read a lot of storybooks and was always irritable. Then we said, then we also looked at self-observation to say, you know, a lot of times earlier when you related about your life, reading always seemed to coincide with when you're sad. So when you're really sad, you seem to read a lot. And then we said, could this be depression? So then we took the laptop and started typing together, you know, high functioning depression. And then we said, okay, seems like so many things fit. So maybe you were depressed then. And then we went on to uncover cognitive life. So problems to emotion, then to cognition. I, he said, I left everything in 12th standard. 
I thought I should solve every problem in maths, physics, chemistry. I must be thorough. And then I felt I wasn't doing enough because I wasn't able to solve every problem. So I went to find inspiration so that I have the energy to do everything that it takes. I needed to prove to dad uh, that I was capable. Then I said to him, oh, so this looks like do or die. And he's like, exactly. And then we looked at the wishes formulation, which was a vicious circle of impossible expectation, sense of failure, demotivation. And then we looked at cognitive restructuring where there was, you know, all or none really and work with parents to help them understand what this child has been and going through. Now, and he also said one thing, do not tell my dad that I have depression and possibly I feel he may blame me for it. So that's the amount of trust issues that this child has had with his parent. So when we look at it from the de developmental perspective, an educational environment where the child experiences failure, even high achieving children, and so this is a huge psychosocial stress for them. It's intensified in the context of conflict with parents, where it means more because this child really wanted to prove himself. And a parenting style, which looks at the same kind of parenting style that you would apply to a child, where you may say something without adequate explanation. But with adolescents, there's only discussion. So when that is applied here, a lot of problems. Also, we can see his search for autonomy here, which is why it helped to help him decide when do you want to come for a session? How long do you want to the, the session? What do you want to talk about? So these things also help uh, with autonomy and increase compliance. Individuation where they are looking at assuming role as members of adult society. So it's important to help them individuate. So that's this. Moving on to the next scenario, which is what is wrong with a little cut if it makes me feel better? Which is what a young person told me. And that was a totally different perspective that I, that put me on a different perspective to self-harm. Whereas self-harm as, oh my God, a terrible thing to, you know, if that is a small thing that makes me feel better, why should I not try it? And it really made me think that day. I saw a 17 year old girl with recurrent depressive disorder, social anxiety, body image, issues and parental marital discord on SSRIs, was unable to attend school and was at home the entire time. She said, when I felt so down, there is very little that I can do. And if this just helps me a little bit. When we look at developmental perspective here, there's egocentricity. So everyone with her social anxiety, everybody's watching me. I cannot make a mistake. I will look like such a fool every time that she interacts with somebody else. Early peer relationship for this child was very dismissive and depreciating. So when a young person looks at them in context of peer relationships, this is what their self-image looks like to them. So when it come, came to identity formation, wasn't great in terms of who am I and always am I good enough? And the answer being I'm not good enough. So we looked at approach here. So we said, and she said, I'd rather not talk about it. As in she meant this is not open for negotiation. Especially, you know, if you're going to be anti-cut. And I said, okay, it's difficult. And nobody wants to talk about difficult things. I would like to talk about things that make life easier for you. But we need to have life for us to discuss those things. So, you know, life-threatening behaviors take priority over other issues. But to look and to look at exploratory statements. Oh, did you cut versus, you know, what is the story behind these cuts? You know, tell me all about that. And then we discovered, we did something called behavioral chain analysis. We looked at what happened first was she met an old classmate and said, you know, I'm going to school and I'm attending this college. So because she really didn't want to say she was sitting at home and doing nothing. There was impaired sleep. And then came the prompting event. So while she was already mulling over this, Mom criticized the state of her room and an online friend that she was really close to canceled the meeting without giving a reason. And this gave rise to some emotions, sadness, older thoughts, I am worthless, no one likes me. And then came behavior, which was cutting and then consequence, which gave emotional relief. So there's overwhelming emotional pain and this gave relief. To that, 
a sense of physical punishment, you're worthless and you deserve it. And a support system which came in to say, oh my God, did you do that? Her mother coming in and talking to her. And then, so we looked at approach here with summarizing. I understand this as a behavior. It relieved tension in short term. It gave you a sense of control through overwhelming emotions. It activated your support network, which was your mom. And I overall see it as a step of adaptive behavior, which is you were looking at it as something to control overwhelming emotions. Empathizing. I understand that it is effective in intense emotional pain. And at this point, it seems like you have difficulty in resisting these impulses and stopping this. Because possibly, maybe, maybe because you have emotional regulation and distress tolerance is still difficult. And this cutting came up when you thought I'm worthless and no one likes me. Maybe we can work on challenging that so that those thoughts do not come and then therefore we do, don't have self-harm. And then we looked at, okay, so this looked at a context. So we are both not fighting about not harming herself. We are like, okay, short term, it seems like an adaptive strategy. So I sidestep that conflict. And then we look at, let's work on something before that. So to look at, you know, how can she be comfortable with herself not going to school at that point? How can we look at how she looks at herself? in terms of uh, reinforcing small adaptive behaviors and then working on body image and identity. So a lot of times I feel it's about negotiation and hearing the adolescent there as opposed to even the bias that I might have where I may view self-harm as something, oh my God, you know, so distressing and we could do without it. But a lot of times I see myself looking at sidestepping it for the moment while I teach them skills so that they're able to overcome it by themselves. Three, a silent young person. I mean, um, earlier when, um, I mean, I, I uh, was a very shy person to talk to people was very, very difficult. So especially when you're talking to a young person who's not talking at all, it can be so difficult. So a lot of times silence, can be precipitated by intense anxiety. We look at that when we look at developmental history, we know this child is slow to warm up, may have had elective mutism as a child. This anger, which is most commonly what we face when we see young people who've been told, like usually for some parents before they come to the clinic, they may say, you know, we're taking you to fun mall or we're taking you to a dentist and then bring them in and it's so annoying for them. And so they'll be sitting without speaking anything. Developmental delay, of course, where they do not have the necessary language skills. Mental illnesses like, let's say, trauma, psychosis, where they're afraid to talk about things. So these are things where silence could play a role. R was a 14-year-old boy who had school refusal for four months and excessive internet use. Of course, family context, there was intense discord and separation and there was discord among all family members in the, where he was living at this point. He wasn't told about the consultation. So when we looked at it, so I knew that I possibly had to do the entire thing. So what I like to do when, especially when I know that a child isn't speaking and I feel a little uncomfortable with an audience, I usually ask the family members to move. So that I have only me and the adolescent intro introduction of oneself, giving the child time to respond and saying non-verbal responses are okay. Establishing the context. So in this case, I said, you know, of course, I'm, I'm sorry that you weren't told, but you know, this is the context and they seem really worried. Uh, but um, I mean, I'm not going to deceive you by saying I am something else. This is what I do. I just help young people, but we do it collaboratively. Exhibiting interest in what they are all. And I'm really keen to know what your version of events are. And validating that I've heard from them that sometimes you take time to warm up to people. So I understand you may have difficulty talking in the present time. There's no pressure to talk even before the session is over. But, you know, let me talk about what my understanding is and you can chip in when you feel the need to. Specific approach with this child was that talking is not the only mode of communication. Pen papers available, you can write if you wish. Active engagement is both of us can write. 
let's get to know you so we sidestep again likes dislikes scheduled friends before clinical context and where we are equal which is would you like to ask me any questions so we both asked each other questions thankfully for me this worked so both of us wrote and what i saw was that some questions took so much longer to answer so then what we did we do did something called a talk meter so then i said so some things too difficult to talk about hesitant but can try to answer the question can talk about it so even as we were writing some things were very difficult for the person to write so then we would leave away too difficult to talk about can try we give some time can talk about it of course he would write at once so then i asked about depression anxiety symptoms and he would tick worries about parents i asked a lot of leading questions so here leading questions were what we could go with and then we worked on okay what are the things so looking at the problem i look at three things school there's a problem parental discord family situation where everybody is fighting what would you like to work on so we still looked at goals together and he said school family so then we looked at you know i'm so cheerleading and giving compliments so we looked at oh, okay you know that's great that you know you had such a difficult time but you're still able to make a choice and i'm glad that we we can work on this and we can see if you want to work on the other issues or not that's still in your hand so then we looked at school related anxiety avoidance graded exposure and we negotiated with each other that gadgets are really unhelpful so i need to tell your grandparents that they would be switched off at all times so we still looked at collaborative and then i looked at you know if if school refusal continues for months two months then we may need to consider admission it wasn't a threat it was about it may be that i'm not able to help you in this way so then we can get to the ward and so more intensive work can be done and he said surprisingly that that may motivate me maybe in, in, instead of going to the ward i will come regularly he also made suggestions later maybe you can talk to my granddad he knows my inner world then eventually when time went on we set a date we said okay can we talk maybe on you know a month later so we set a date to talk and then we looked at so ensuring that he was a part of the decision making process at every stage i'm going to ask please mute yourselves so moving on so these were the challenging situations then moving on to dilemmas where i'm not saying uh, i one way is right on another but these are dilemmas that we all of us face like young people who tell us you ask me so many questions i would like to know about you age marital status are you married is the person next door your husband i mean who's you know practicing nearby uh, children where do you stay personal experiences have you had a boyfriend uh, have you ever failed in an exam in developmental perspective uh i see that see they are uh, reveal so much they talk about themselves so much they possibly need a more revealing mode of communication there a blank screen approach where i don't say anything and you know the therapist is like a mirror i don't know less likely to understand a therapist role like i remember a young person who asked a therapist uh, are you like a friend and the therapist said no i cannot be your friend and it was so upsetting for the young person and you know almost had a relapse of depressive symptoms for 2 3 days and to the person young person it was like a rejection so okay i am not good enough to be a friend so these are things to think about approach so one approach the traditional approach says neutrality where they say don't encourage don't condemn demonstrate curiosity and interest in why did this question come explore motivation behind the question versus another approach which is careful self disclosure which is the self disclosure is for the young person's benefit not your own and readiness for an open dialogue i see myself going more and more to careful self disclosure like a lot of people who say i bet you've never had therapy and i say look i go to an older psychiatrist when i really feel the need to help and i am looking for a regular therapist so as we understand more and more that therapy is 
also is therapy is not only therapy it's also the relationship that brings about the change so how can it be done in a one way process and lot of young people are also looking at um ways to find a new adult that they can identify with their traits as you know lot of young people who may come to you say i want to take up psychology so they want to understand themselves better and want to look up to you also so in one way to be doing careful disclosure may not be such a terrible thing as long as it is well thought out like some people say i'm interested in cooking so you know i watch monster chef you watch it and we look at okay what are the best parts of the show I'm going to stop a bit because it's distracting. Can we? Yeah, trying to do that. Okay, fine. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, then to look at uh, discussion on the best parts of the show, things like that, that brings a bit of lightness to this. Um, some young people ask, "What is your view on homosexuality?" And to say, "Why would you ask that?" So here, I really wanted to know why this young person is asking this. The young person said to me, "I want to support the LGBT cause. I want to participate in a moment, a rally." When I looked at this young person, this was a socially anxious adolescent who found it so much easier to communicate on social media than in person. So when we looked at this. this was so important for her for us to say you know i support this cause and i believe you will one day be able to participate in this fight for equal rights so there was affirmation there was self disclosure about what my stand was but it was important in this case so i think it has a key role in a collaborative relationship it also sends a powerful message that we are on an equal footing thoughtful use is beneficial other times when there are questions that make me uncomfortable i look at it to say i am somebody who cares about you a lot but i would really like the session to be more about you than me so it cannot be there to fulfill my needs which is why i may not be able to answer this question but i still leave it open for dialogue moving on when a session starts with will you keep it confidential so young people as we saw even in that qualitative study they are so keen about confidentiality so there was a 16 year old boy who came in who was self referred mom said it's about study related stress and the only question he asked me as soon as he sat was will you keep it confidential as we know there are many thoughts that cross our mind then therapy is not in vacuum on one hand parents are the people who bring the young person for therapy they need to be informed about progress there's also a competing need to protect the young person's privacy so where is this going to lead to me and then there's a thing where will this young person not tell me what it is and what if he's in grave trouble so then we look at this is a private space where you can talk about your thoughts and feelings this is private and whatever you talk about stays in the room except for three exceptions and these are things that more and more uh, we get, find ourselves saying right at the first session if you tell me that you're in danger of some kind physical abuse sexual abuse contemplating suicide i have to talk to your parents about it if you tell me that another person is in danger of some sort i have to do something other situations where your safety is at stake running away uh, sex with multiple partners harmful use of substances harmful online interactions are also things that i need to think about and we still have a discussion about it to say look i need i would like you to take some time to reach an independent decision your trust is so important to me but when takes when i have safety and trust i'm going to choose safety simply because i need you to be there for me to work on some things so this is where i stand 
and I want you to be able to think this through and come back to me. And then he said, okay, I'll say it. I worry that I'm a pedophile. With this, another set of train of thoughts came in. Considering uh, my, you know, bit of work with people with abuse. So I wondered, you know, can I work with somebody who thinks about harming young people? Can I be non-judgmental? So I said, okay, if I find myself being biased or anger, I will refer. I thought this in my head. I didn't say this to the young person. I said, let, let me look at what this is. He said, I watched child pornography about three years ago. In 12th standard, then I realized it was wrong about three, four months ago. So I'd already watched it when I was nine. I didn't know that something was off about it. After that, I never watched it. But in 12th standard, I realized child pornography viewing was wrong. And I started wondering, what if it means I have sexual feelings for children? He avoided children. He had physical symptoms of anxiety. What if somebody finds out? What will happen to my future? Will I never be able to have children? So when you look at developmental perspective, so on one hand, there's evolution of identity, formation of sexual orientation, curiosity about sex, and we know limited opportunities to discuss sexuality related issues in our setting. So when we looked at sexual history, sexual feelings, he was aroused by women, girls, never by children. And then we were able to see through looking at that, that this was clearly anxiety. And then to say, to externalize it, to say, you know, this is anxiety, it's separate from you. It does not indicate preference. And we looked at how anxiety leads to avoidance and how he avoids children, which continues to make him wonder whether he really, you know, has these kind of preferences towards children. And he said, but what if I am? What if there's no real way of knowing? And then we looked at, okay, even if he were, he still has a choice to act on his desires or not. And the fact that he came to seek help is already an indication of that desire. So he will still have control over it. Can we look at avoiding avoidance? And then we saw gradual reduction in anxiety. After all of this was done, so he was clear he wasn't a pedophile, he had no anxiety, he still did not want this information to be shared with his parents. So then it becomes so, and, and then to answer, I was really in a position, I'm like, how do I answer his parents? But he was very clear. And I knew this did not fill my criteria to overstep confidentiality. So. I discussed with the adolescent every time what the parent would be told. If you want, I could do it in your presence. I spoke to the parents about the difference between privacy and secrecy. The purpose of the consultation is to promote freedom of space and that your son had some issues that he discussed with me. And he is in, learn, you know, in the process of managing them. As, as you can see, his anxiety is much better. But he seems to feel comfortable speaking only here about it. And a lot of times parents can feel so many mixed emotions about it to say, okay, you know, does he not trust me enough? And then we look at it to say, I, I don't think that may be the reason, but to talk to a stranger about it and move where you don't have to see them again is a different thing versus living with your parents and wondering about what they're thinking of you. So I said that I don't think this is about closeness or not, but this is about what is, can be shared with whom. And I, at any point, if there's something where which leads to self-harm or the child is in a difficult position, I will inform you. And this seemed okay with this parent. And that's what we did. Maintain confidentiality throughout. Another dilemma, so where a young person says, I tried dry humping, 19 year old. So one was, of course, I had to go back and look on Google what dry humping was. But I mean, that's how, <laughs> older generation I am, I guess. So a 19 year old girl with depressive episode, PTSD, substance misuse, whose again, family history had difficult family circumstances, ha didn't have, wasn't attending college, frequent issues with peers. And one particular session said this and said, don't discuss with my parent. But of course, I'm not discussing confidentiality in this bit. So I looked at self-reflection. What is my own view of an ad adolescent sexuality? What is my own value system and is it going to interfere with this? And if I am of the view that, you know, adolescents cannot have sex, I'll have to keep that aside. So, so that I can be non-critical and 
you know non judgmental and show positive regard because they are so quick to sense disapproval tone gesture so here again we went from facts to events to emotions to thoughts circumstances we looked at okay you know what made you go through with that what happened before that so this was a new year's party she said there was a stranger both of us were you know had drunk some alcohol i had always wanted to try it and you know when he suggested it i thought okay i said what were your feelings after this i felt it was a step to adulthood i was worried if he will reveal it to others what will my friends think i don't want my parents to find out so then we looked at paraphrasing labeling emotions so you have a lot of mixed feelings about this then we moved on to context so to look at explorative facilitative statements like i wonder if your mood and recent worries about not being at par with because everybody is at college and you're not did it have something to do with that will you think about it she said yes i've been feeling next session feeling sad about peers moving on in terms of education best friend having a boyfriend and i was looking at making a change for years i was quite thrilled that somebody asked me i had just wanted to kiss but you know i went with the flow i had to stop the person from proceeding further when he suggested that we go all the way I was quite relieved with that choice so affirmation you were assertive here then we moved on to psychoeducation where the link between depression and high risk sexual behavior and then we moved on to a window approach so we want is dry humping a good thing or bad thing but good health yes there is needs there are pleasures but we look at privacy consent and boundaries is this the right place to do this was i being forced can i trust this person so a new person versus somebody i know how far do i want to physically engage with this person before i do health and safety have i considered the risks of pregnancy will i be safe are there ways to have safe sex and to look at a happy healthy responsible sexual life who do i want to have a relationship with how do i make decisions about involvement is it okay to go out is it okay to hold hands do i want to be more deeply involved how long do i know him how well do i know him what are my expectations from this relationship what are this person's do we have the same ones evaluating future consequences of present actions to self and the family it's not about right and wrong but how we make a decision and analyze consequences before we do it that matters so our discussion was solely on this and to look at how we can be safe so coming to my almost the end to look at a clinician related dilemma that comes to me each time i mean when i am in practice because i practice in an exclusively private setting now to look at an early career child and adolescent psychiatrist so i have a 14 year old girl who came who was diagnosed with bpd anxiety parental discord again on lithium and risperidone an elder sister who has an adjustment disorder a parent who has a high degree of anxiety a large family with multiple issues between family members so the way i can see it a needs individual work her sister needs work there's family work to be done who does all of this so they say an overwhelming an adolescent a person who works with adolescents uh is this is difficult and has a lot of emotional impact on the psychiatrist or the therapist themselves there's often little time for recovery between crisis implementing interventions and reviewing practice so i do something and where is the time to review it there are time constraints so how many people do i get to see in a day how much time do i spend lack of trained personnel to deal with this cost so if i were to treat three people what would the cost be management in the terms of not only managing this client but if i say i manage the clinic i manage my receptions i manage the finances i manage the pharmacy so overall on one person so these are the perils so it's not only about being a psychiatrist so there are all of these things to consider so the approach really is network 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 train more people a reflective practice i view this as something that is so so important because ever since um about i think a year ago uh some things were very overwhelming and i had started to think about am i doing the right thing is this right for this client i was very very anxious and i i started doubting each move that i make and once i started reflective practice so want to think about what i did how i did which way i reacted discussing 
with a supervisor i felt um, on one hand it gave me a space to be wrong sometimes to have doubts about myself to be able to voice out ideas and this made things so less anxiety provoking peer support to talk to so many other adolescent psychiatrists about things to be mentored so i am still looking for mentors <laughs> uh how do we run a practice what are the things we look at what are the uh, dilemmas that we face how do um, you know older psychiatrists navigate that in terms of uh, parent and especially women psychiatrists how do we have a balance between work and life self care self care do we focus on self care there are so many memes no where it's psychiatrists talk about or therapists talk about self care and they're looking so haggard that's me so this is really something we need to think about when we want to work with adolescents broader challenges how do we prevent things i mean we're so focused on preventive curative work where is time for preventive work is there app based video based promotive things that are possible where is space for advocacy for equal opportunities for young people with autism advocacy in the school system itself because i mean sometimes it just doesn't fulfill the needs of young people group intervention for limited resource settings where do we do something about battling stigma and then generation of research and resources that fit our setting as opposed to a western setting and fitting a western module of psychotherapy to an indian setting where is resources that are relevant to us i think child nimhan child project is a very useful resource that i see myself using so these are broader challenges that we all need to seek answers that we all need to seek answers to summary summary it's so difficult it is difficult yet rewarding because so many young people need a little push to get so better fraught with dilemmas and challenges it helps to keep a developmental perspective connect with our inner adolescence often i look at okay how was i when i was an adolescent what did i think how was it to me it that helps me relate better understanding the world of adolescents today a lot of time i take lessons from adolescents who come to me what does this mean how does this mean how do people look at this you know what is pubg like teach me how to play this what is youtube like what is a good editing software things like that being creative conveying hope and empowerment that is only possible with good self care <laughs> reflection supervision peer support and and any dilemma guiding light always act in the child's best interest and i leave you with only this if we are committed to developing young people we must be committed in developing ourselves thank you so much these are my references thank you thank you dr somya that was an extensive presentation uh, the forum is open for discussion now queries clarifications can be posted in the chat box so that we will be able to the speaker will be able to answer I think uh, Ravanya Loganathan uh, has raised her hands. Can you unmute her, Ravanya Loganathan? Host, can you unmute Ravanya Loganathan? Ravanya, please. Yeah, there is a question. Uh, how to deal with an authoritarian parent of an adolescent? How to deal with an authoritarian parent? Is that what you're saying? அதாவதுக்கு <laughs> um what kind of an approach worked how did we get them to agree so to see if they are able to um let's say when i model able to get some ideas out of it uh, to see what works so i look at uh, showing them what is done getting feedback 
helping them try out things and may, maybe getting them to reflect what are the things that don't work. And that's how I deal with it, authoritarian parents. So there is a, a question from uh, Tangela Raminath. Should okay. we tell parents about the substance use like smoking cannabis? Right. Uh, what is the question there? Uh, should we reveal to be Yes, see, uh, the way I look at it, how harmful is it? What is the duration of use? How frequent is it? Uh, I, I take a call depending on how frequent and intense I think it is, what uh, the intent behind it is, depression versus uh, impulsive risk taking versus I just want to try it once. So I, I think it's important to take a call based on that. But a lot of times, considering that I've already spoken to them about confidentiality and said that if they're using substances that I worry about, I will talk about it. What I do with them is, can you see that this is worrying on one hand and, uh, you know, and maybe if it is like this, I may have to talk to the parent on one hand. The other hand, I also talk about a ticking time bomb. I say, look, you're doing this without your parents' knowledge, but your parents are reasonably smart, no? So someday or the other, they will find out. What do you think their reaction will be then? So do you want to explode a bomb and see what its consequences are today? versus not know when it's going to happen and worry about it. And a lot of times when you take these two approaches, they're able to see that talking about it is better, preempting it is better than a sudden, you know, disaster that strikes. So we're able to do it together. And then when they know there is an adult who trusts them and um, is there for them, they are willing to share it themselves. They'll say, okay, I will only say it. And that's that. But if it comes to a point where they are not willing and I feel it's dangerous, I evoke, will invoke uh, my, um, you know, what is not party to my confidentiality and say it in front of them. There is a query, please share tips for getting into the sexual relationship with Sri Vidya. Oh, I ask directly, are you sexting? Are you, are you having sex with your boyfriend? I think this is the easiest way to do it. You only, we only need practice because it's, it is, I mean, I, I don't think as a 19 year old, I was, I mean, maybe I was imagining doing it, but I wasn't actually doing it. So it takes a lot of practice to say it as casually as possible, but I think you jump right in. Uh, participants who have your queries can also raise your hand so that we'll be able to unmute you and you can uh, raise your questions. So, uh, how to handle a violent, hostile adolescent? This question is asked by so many of the participants. See, uh, a hostile, different from violent, a hostile young person, I like to move out. So I, I'm not expecting them to come into the chamber at all. So I go out. Sometimes I've gone in the car. I may speak to them to say, this is what I do. This is who I am. I hear these things. Can we, do you think you want to take help for these things? This is what I do. And I make sure nobody's touching, shoving, pushing them. And I see if they're ready to do that. And a lot of time when you go out, they are willing to come. On the other hand, a violent person who's hitting, beating, biting, um, we still can look at, so if he is at harm to himself, then we need to look at sedation. But it, it, it can also be done in such a friendly way to say, you know, look, you know, I, I think you're going to harm yourself. And so I'm going to inject you at this point. So you'll have two people holding you. And I'm so sorry that this may be difficult. So, you know, so we're going to be holding you and sedating you so that you will not harm yourself or other people. And do it. Okay. So uh, we are almost uh, running short of time. Yeah. So we can take a quick one or uh, two more questions. Okay. Uh, can you put in some approach principles to handle adults, adolescents with delinquent behavior? Sorry, Mark. I think it's all.
uh, how to handle adolescents with delinquent behavior the adolescents are adolescents i don't think the problem makes it different i think we see the adolescent for who they are and look at what context their problem comes from i don't see a ado delinquent adolescents are any different from any other adolescent um the basis is a trusting relationship look at there's always a basis in the sense if they're prone i mean they've been subjected to violence they are violent there's adhd untreated there are so many traumatic experiences look at the person and then see you will find a way of what you need to do Okay. Thank you, Dr. Soumya. Uh, I think uh, there are uh, more questions which are almost repetition of what we have already discussed. Yeah, thanks. So, thank you very much, Dr. Soumya, for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Sujeeva. <laughs>